No matter right. how good your design is, if your primary function is to welcome cars, it will never be a welcoming space for people walking, for people cycling, for children, for seniors, for people with mobility impairments. Think about how subtraction can add to our lives and subtraction can add to our communities. And the more that I thought about this, the more that I thought, the more spaces we subtract cars from in our communities, the more places we add people to. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman and that is Justin Jones. Uh coming back on the podcast for a second time. Uh, Justin uh, resides up in Ontario, Canada, and we are going to be talking about intentional streets. Uh, so it, let's get right to it with Justin Jones. Justin, welcome. Thanks, John. So, uh, so happy to be here again. Thank you for, hey. for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, Justin, why don't you do a, a quick favor? Uh, why don't you just uh, you know, share a little bit about yourself? Uh, yeah, thanks. So my name's Justin Jones, and uh, I'm I'm joining you today from uh, Collingwood, Ontario, up here in uh, in beautiful Canada. Um, I am a an active transportation planner and community engagement specialist with uh, with WSP Canada, and um, so I, I mostly work on active transportation planning and, and community engagement efforts. Uh, and I really love what I do. I love connecting with people uh, and talking about the different ways that, that we can improve our communities through through active transportation and, and uh, reimagining what our streets look like. And so I'm so excited to uh, to share the the new concept that I'm that I've been thinking about with you here today, John, and um, talk about how we can be a little bit more intentional about what our streets look like. Fantastic. I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> and in fact, I did say welcome back because you have been on the podcast before, uh, way back in season one in 2020, episode number 49, you were uh, joining me with uh, Matt Pender and uh, we had a fabulous little discussion about uh, feet struts or bicycle priority streets as they are also known. And that was a real hoot to do that. And that was the audio only version. So now it's fun to have you here uh, on video. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I've always been told that I have a face for radio, so uh, this is this is a little bit uncomfortable for me being on the video. But you know, I'm <laughs> I'm so happy to be here, and and you know, it was really that that episode and that discussion with uh, with Matt, um, who's now my colleague here at WSP Canada, uh, who I get to work with every day, and and it's an absolute joy to to be surrounded by such amazing people. But it was that it was that initial conversation, that initial discussion about about Feetstrot that really I think planted the seed in me. Uh, that, that's led to to the the piece about intentional streets that uh, that I'm working on right now, and and that I'm excited to uh, to go live with and, and have more discussions about uh, in the future. Yeah. So why don't you introduce us to the concept? What do we what do we mean, or what do you mean by intentional street? Well, when I think about intentional spaces, um, you know the the. The story for me really goes back to the idea that when we design spaces with an intent, um, they can become really welcoming to the people that we aim to engage. Um, so, you know, the, the way that I like to, to start this off is just is by sharing a little story. And, um, you know, it's a story that that starts as most of my stories do with my with my kids. Um, I've got two young daughters and, you know, we really love uh, the, the lifestyle here in Collingwood, the, the kind of live work play that we're allowed to do. And the one day we were out on our on our cargo bike and we were out for a bike ride. We were just, you know, enjoying the summer sun and we went down to the waterfront and we we hopped out of the cargo bike. The, the kids kind of needed to run around for a bit. And, and my four year old, um, we went to the uh, to the labyrinth and my four year old Josephine ran right to the middle of the labyrinth. And as you can see here on the screen, she she sat down in a quiet pose, uh, kind of hands to heart. And, and she just sat there and had like a little moment of, of quiet meditation. And I was so struck by that because I didn't tell Josephine what to do. I didn't say, Josie, go have a meditation in the middle of that, in the middle of the labyrinth here. Josie saw that space and realized that there was a design intent behind that space. And, and Josie responded to that intent. And so, you know, that, that it really just kind of planted that seed in my head about what can happen when we are intentional about how we design our public spaces. And so, you know, it really did kick me off on, on a bit of a journey of, of thinking about what it means to conceptualize streets, not just as streets, but as public spaces. 
And so I started to, you know, I think it, it, it kind of sat in my head for a little while and it wasn't until another time when I was out with my kids and, and we were at a newly designed playground and, and maybe I'll talk a little bit about that after, but um, you know, I, I, before I, before I do that, you know, I'd, I'd like to, I'd like to start off and, and just ask you, John, um, what's the most recent time in public space that you felt really welcomed in that public space? Ah, uh, yes. Well, I mean, it's a little unfair since I just got back from Delft. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, one of the great things about many of the Dutch cities is that there are plentiful places that are truly designed, uh, intentionally designed to be welcoming for people. And uh, there, there's there's actually a, a favorite street, and uh, I, I keep coming back to this little street. I would pass by it every morning as I was uh, either riding into the downtown area there in Delft to get coffee or to go to the train station. It was just it's just this really narrow, delightful little street. It's shared space, and the the design of it, the, the, the scale of it in all and everything else just makes it, you know, a, a, a truly welcoming space, even though everybody's welcome regardless of mode. So cars are welcome there. Uh, and, uh, but, and I, and I think this kind of gets to where I think you're going to go is the difference between, creating spaces that where where you feel like you're able to go versus whether it's truly inviting Mm -hmm. and uh, and this was a a street that i just felt like i was drawn to it um just because it was such an inviting environment Mm. and when was that when were you there uh so i was just there a few weeks ago so yeah fantastic Yeah, yeah now can i ask you when was the last time you were driving on what you would call kind of more like a freeway in a car Oh gosh, uh, probably the last time I had to, you know, go towards uh, the airport, drop somebody off at the airport. So yeah, yeah. So probably even more recently. Uh, even more recently, yeah. yeah, yeah. So so I would I would actually challenge your assertion that the last time you felt truly welcomed in a public space was that time in De- in Delft, and I would say that the last time you were truly welcomed in a public space was when you were on that highway. Hmm. And, yeah, well, and that's, I, a good, I, that's a good reframing of it. Yeah, a, a different context in, in the exactly. sense that as a I was welcomed as a driver uh, in 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 that realm. Yeah, yeah, and that's exactly it. I think when it comes mm-hmm. to the idea of intentional streets, mm-hmm. I think that what we want to start thinking about is when we are thinking about the purpose of our public space. When we look at a highway, I think that a highway is actually an incredible example of just how intentional we can be when we Mm -hmm. want to truly welcome a particular user into a space. Highways are designed with wide lanes, uh, with minimal crossings, with minimal interactions with other users, typically with very smooth uh, surfaces. They are the ultimate space that shows what we can do when we want to be welcoming to cars, to people right. in cars. Yeah. And so when you are driving, a highway is, a, is an extremely welcoming space. Right. Now, the corollary of that is that a highway is also an extremely exclusive space if you are not walking or if you are right. not driving. So a highway is designed to be welcoming to the car in the ultimate. And what I, what I want to challenge people on with the concept of intentional streets is to start thinking about why we can apply that so rigorously to highways and why we've been so poor at applying that same ideal to spaces for people in North America. Right. And so, so, you know, when, when we think about being welcomed in a space, I think that being welcomed depends on the context in which we are moving through it. Right. And I think that it's important for us to engage in conversation with our communities about who And what is welcomed in our public spaces, who and what is accommodated, and who and what is excluded from our public spaces through our designs. And I think that those are three different things that we don't really talk about when it comes to the differences in how we're using our public space. We are frequently, you know, when you talked about that street and you mentioned that, that cars are welcomed on that street, I would argue that in a feet strut or, or in kind of a, a slow neighborhood street, cars are accommodated. 
there you go in those yeah. streets people yeah. are welcomed cars yeah. are accommodated and that is a distinction that i think we should be more deliberate about drawing when we are designing our public space when we are thinking about who is it that is our target audience for this space and how is this space serving them and so who are we welcoming who are we accommodating and who are we excluding in the design of our public space because at the end of the day i think that we have fallen into a trap in north america where we are trying to you know we're 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 really like going down the the strode mentality of uh, of chuck marone and strong towns with all of our streets right all of our streets are being designed to welcome cars right and my argument with intentional streets is that when you design spaces to welcome cars you can never do more than accommodate everyone else no matter right. how good your design is if your primary function is to welcome cars it will never be a welcoming space for people walking for people cycling for children for seniors for people with mobility impairments any of those folks who are excluded from the public space merely by the presence of those of the fact that we're welcoming cars in every a- uh, avenue of our communities and so that's what i want to kickstart a conversation about with the idea of intentional streets and it's the idea of of really looking at how our public space is operating and asking ourselves are we okay with that right. is that how we really want our limited public space to be used in our communities because we are incredibly uh, ingenious when it comes to designing public spaces to welcome children or seniors or people with disabilities or you know um, places for people to sit and gather we are we are very good at doing that in places like parks or um, you know community centers or or open spaces um, but what we are not good at doing is applying those same questions to public space that in most communities makes up the biggest collection of our shared public space and that's our streets and i think that that is really to our detriment because we are losing access to all of this public space because we insist that welcoming cars be the first thing that we do right and it's partly too is you know when we get to uh, you mentioned chuck marone's work when we get to the definition of what is a street versus what is a road slash highway and you know that mashup that we get and and that's part of the challenge that we have in north america and many other uh cities and and states and municipalities around the globe is that we've mashed this up we've taken highway standards and concepts of welcoming cars and literally everywhere and then you know applied it to you know areas where we're like well yeah i mean this isn't welcoming to anybody except for cars and of course the irony is it doesn't work that well for cars either um but (laughs) i mean yes to to your point now what's really really important about intentional streets is the the fact that you you're, you're making a point of identifying that uh the difference between a street versus a road versus a highway a street is a very different place, you know, as Chuck would say, the, a street is the platform for building wealth. And and this is where you, you meet other people and this is where transactions happen. And, you know, in, in your neighborhood streets, I mean, it, it's it's a completely different context than this. You know, <laughs> it's a <laughs> completely different context than this. And it should be intentionally. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think you've really... Um, you know, you've, you've got to, to the heart of it quite quickly, which is that when it comes to roads, when it comes to the, you know, the, the types of, of corridors that are connecting communities and really uh, the, the primary focus is to move uh, people and goods at relatively high speeds um, and across relatively significant different distances, um, particularly in the North American context. It's important to recognize that uh, the question about, you know, who should be the priority user on those kinds of corridors the answer might be cars. And and right. that's an okay thing for it to be in communities. But what I want to focus on with the idea of intentional streets is that we should at least be asking that question with every road that is going through our communities, every street that uh, that is interacting with our schools. And we should start thinking about how that public space is being allocated and who is being welcomed and who is being accommodated and who is being left out. And we should have an open dialogue about whether or not 
the fact that we are excluding a large number of people from our public space aligns with our community values. Right. You know, I think that if you stood up in a community meeting and you asked residents of almost any place and you said, how would people feel about designing our public spaces so that children and seniors and people with disabilities are not welcome? I think for, for the most part, people would really like stand up and say, absolutely not. We, we're not OK with that. We don't want you know, we don't want our new park to not accommodate children or seniors or people with disabilities. Right. But those conversations don't happen when it comes to streets. And, and we are, I think, doing a disservice to the limited amount of public space that we have available within our communities when we don't engage in those in those foundational conversations about how our public spaces are being allocated. And so that's really what I'm trying to drive at with intentional streets is getting to a place where we can open up those conversations, where we can encourage people to imagine their streets as public space uh, and where we can then get them thinking about what values are being expressed in the design of their street and, and how is that aligning with the values that they'd like to see in their community. Yeah. And so in some instances, there are going to be roads where when we ask, like, who do we want to welcome on this road or, or street? There are going to be corridors where people, I keep defaulting to road when I'm talking about the car, uh, the, the car welcoming ones. Um, you know, there are going to be spaces where, where you know, the, the decision is going to be we want to welcome cars. That is our priority user. But we are currently kind of sleepwalking through that decision. And we are defaulting to welcoming cars as our primary user on every single street in our community. Yeah. You know, one need look no further. I've, you know, my little, my little street out front of my house here um, probably, probably carries on average, maybe 200 vehicles a day tops. Um, you know, it's a narrow residential street. There's no sidewalks on it. It's in an older, um, you know, kind of older subdivision in the, in the community. And, and, you know, when my kids are out in the front lawn playing, I'm, I'm gripped by a constant sense of anxiety. Right. Because even though there are very few cars going down that street, the, the design of our streets and, and the way that we've imagined our communities has been so welcoming to cars that even just the threat of a car coming along my street is enough to give me anxiety enough to keep my kids away from that public space. Right. And so they are not able to enjoy the connection with their across the street neighbors. The, you know, they, they kind of have to deal with the, the constant, like, you know, don't go near the road yelling from mom and dad when they're out in the front yard. And those are the kinds of things that are, that are consequences that I don't think we talk about when it comes to how we design our communities. And so I want to start a conversation with the idea of intentional streets that really, you know, takes the idea of the feed straw that we talked about earlier and goes a little deeper on it because I think it, it is incumbent on all of us as professionals and, and people with experience in creating more livable communities to, to open up conversations about, about how our communities are, are working uh, and how folks can improve them through just reimagining what our public spaces look like. Yeah. So I, I went back to this image here just to, to, to quickly put a, a kind of a, a fine point on it in, in terms of that, that difference between welcoming and inviting versus, uh, you know, saying that, you know, somebody can do this, you, you're able to do this. Uh, it's, there's a huge difference between saying, you know, by the way, there's a sidewalk here. What's your problem? You know, you're able to do this. Uh, and so it's a very big difference between that. It's one of the, the pet peeves that I have with the complete streets approach at doing things is, uh, is a check box sort of approach and saying that, you know, hey, there's an accommodation here for, you know, a, a person who is walking or a person who's in a wheelchair or a person you know, pushing a, a, a baby stroller. You know, hey, if you really push us, we'll, we'll slap a, a, you know, a, a bike lane down in here and then it, it'll be we'll check that box and it'll be there. I like to say that a complete street isn't complete until it's it's truly welcoming and inviting to to all modes. And and then you can be you know saying, OK, you know. Now we're getting there. It sounds like you're 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 basically saying we need to make a we need to actually decide intentionally who 
is really truly welcomed and invited in this environment. And if it doesn't align with what's on screen <laughs> in the design, then we need to take a step back and we need to say, you know, okay, what is this? Is this just a highway? Is this just a road where we're, we're pro focusing on throughput? And if that's the case, then, you know, in the case of a strode like this, you have to have an honest admission as a highway designer, because now you're basically designing highways, is that this doesn't work well for that either. In fact, it's one of the most dangerous designs of roadways that we have because there's so many conflict points, there's so many driveways, there's so many intersections. And therefore, it's one of the areas where we see the highest crash rates and the highest serious injury and fatality rates. So, I mean, I, I don't, you know, I don't buy it. I mean, if, it, if you're going to be designing highways, design highways. Don't mash them up. Don't, don't try to make it be a street and a road at the same time. And, and I think that is, that's exactly, you know, you, you've, you've hit a couple things that I, that I really wanted to get to. And the, the first is, I think my, my, um, my erstwhile critique of, of some of the uh, complete streets movements and complete streets efforts that go on. And I think you, you know, you hit the nail on the head. Complete streets, I think, in, in the North American context have, have almost always been an exercise in more. They've almost always been an exercise in increasing the amount of right of way, adding in additional things, whether it's a multi-use trail or a sidewalk or a, um, you know, a bus lane or, or you just keep widening, widening, widening until you've, you fit everything in. And, and there has, but wait very a minute, seldom... Justin, it's sounding like you're saying we need to exclude somebody. I mean, who are you trying to exclude? Oh, wait a minute. Here it is. <laughs> yeah. You know, one of the things that I want to challenge our profession on is to really be deliberate about, you know, we, we get asked, I think in, in municipal government, um, you know, they get asked to do more with less all the time. Um, there's always going to be constraints on budget constraints on resources, constraints on space. We get asked to do more with less all the time. Uh, and the thing that I want to emphasize when it comes to intentional streets, uh, is that intentional streets is an exercise in doing more with less. It is an exercise in envisioning the space that you have as serving a different purpose. It is, it is creating a deliberate priority for the welcoming movement of, of children in places where children are going to be, of seniors in places where seniors are going to be, of bikes in corridors that are connected to places where bikes want to be, of communities of color in places where they are living um, so that they are not subjected to uh, just massive numbers of vehicle throughput driving through their neighborhood. Because what we have seen is that every time we try and add more, every time that we, you know, add a, add a lane to a four lane road, and then, you know, while we're doing that project, we also add cycle tracks onto the road, we're, we're accommodating. We are accommodating people on bikes. We are accommodating people walking. We are, you know, sometimes we are accommodating uh, communities of color and low income communities in our designs. But I, I haven't seen many designs in North America that are truly moving towards welcoming those users into the street space. And we have to start having the uncomfortable conversation of the, about the fact that when you welcome cars, you only can do accommodation at best. Um, you know, an environment that is truly welcoming for cars by virtue of the speed, the power, the noise, and the volume of cars that you get when you create a space that is welcoming to them, the result there is that you'll never really do better than accommodating people walking and cycling. And I cannot tell you the number of municipalities whose official plans or transportation master plans or other planning documents I've reviewed have said, we want to prioritize active transportation in our community. And what they fail to do, and what I have yet to see is when we talk about prioritizing active transportation and creating those kinds of spaces for people to move at a human scale or interact with their neighbors or feel safe in their community, you know, without the fear of, of policing or high speed vehicles cutting through their neighborhoods. What I, what I haven't seen in those is the importance of deprioritizing the access to cars that we have given to every single street. 
you know, I think that we we often run into it where we insist essentially as a, as a profession on providing cars uh, de facto and, and by right access to every single square inch of pavement in every single community we build in North America. Um, you know, when we build new subdivisions, it would be it would be absurd to think about building a new subdivision with with a you know with with residential streets that were that were off limits to anyone except for the people who lived there. You know, we've been moving away from the idea of cul-de-sacs in North America, and I think that what I what I want to encourage people to think about is is I think the cul-de-sac had something to tell us. The cul-de-sac told us that people didn't want to live on a street where cars were driving through their neighborhoods at all hours of the day. And so I think what we need to start doing with our, with our existing streets, particularly in our built up urban environments is we need to start saying, these are not streets that are for the use of people driving as their primary mode of transportation. These are the streets that are going to be to let kids have a safe and comfortable and convenient experience walking or biking to school that are going to allow the seniors in this neighborhood to go for a walk without fear of, of someone speeding down their street uh, and running them over um, that are going to create the kinds of spaces where communities of color can gather in their limited public space, because we have unfortunately a, a, a terrible legacy in this, in North America, of, of sending communities of color into the types of, of areas where they have either deficient or no parks to access. And, and the streets become the only public space that they are able to access and streets are heavily policed. Um, and a lot of that goes back to, to the idea of, uh, of law enforcement taking on traffic enforcement. And, and that has led to the expansion of, of the police state in this, in this uh, continent. So I think that when we start to get intentional about what our streets look like. And we start asking that foundational question, who are we welcoming and who are we accommodating and who are we excluding? Um, you know, those are the kinds of questions that I think uh, can get us to a place where, where we've got better communities, but we, we really have to start asking them because um, the, you know, I, I think that a lot of the time the development profession is not moving that way. And, and a lot of the time we're, we're not seeing uh, transportation planning moving that direction either. Yeah. And of course, this particular installation here is a great example of where, you know, we're putting up a temporary uh fix to, uh, you know, try to accommodate or make up for the fact that uh, the, the, the roadway and this particular roadway, this particular street isn't that bad. I mean, it's not massively, massively wide, but at the same time, uh, design wise, we could do some amazing things here from a design perspective, which would really communicate if motor vehicles are allowed, would really communicate uh, that, by the way, you're not prioritized here. You need to proceed with, you know, extreme caution. There's a 30 kilometer uh, per hour sign uh, right there to the to the right. And, you know, a future design might not even need a sign. It might be, you know, very, very clear by the dimensions, by the materials that if a motor vehicle is allowed you're going to be lucky if you're going to be able to go 10 kilometers per hour. I mean, it's a, a completely different context in, 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 in terms of the way that you do this in a way that doesn't require the barriers and the barricades and the signs because of the, the actual design of this, the streetscape. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's, I think you, you kind of get at, at two things that I think is really exciting about the idea of intentional streets. Um, the first is that, you know, if we are intentional about how we are using our streets and we start to look at the network of streets in most of our communities in North America and we start to ask, which ones of those really need to be welcoming for cars? And we start to, to ask that question. I think that what it leads us to is it leads us to a place where we can create high comfort, high quality, low cost facilities that are welcoming for people walking, cycling, wheeling all across North America. And, and we can do it relatively quickly because, you know, while this is obviously a temporary installation, the school streets movement, 
I think that when we when we think about how we could do temporary installations of of streets that are more welcoming to people walking and cycling and less welcoming but more accommodating for cars you know there are there are streets all over our communities particularly residential and, and quieter collector roads that would be immediately uh, improved for access for people walking and cycling simply by taking a more intentional approach to how those streets are being used. And then I think that the the other thing that you identify is once we've got that initial conversation started in our communities, once we've started to look at our streets as public space again, and once we've started to see them more as a potential extension of our front lawns, a a place where we can gather, where we can connect with our neighbors, uh, where we can meet our community, that's when I think the real like creativity takes hold and we can start seeing all sorts of creative use of this public space um, that's going to much better serve our communities than a bunch of people sitting alone in their metal boxes, uh, you know, driving past their neighbor's houses. Um, you know, the, I, I've never made a friend from behind the windshield, not once. Um, but I can tell you without a doubt that, you know, some of the best friendships that I've forged in my community have been forged because of my either my cargo bike or you know being out and walking and cycling or experiencing public space with my kids and we are robbing ourselves of that through the design of our streets and I, I think it is it is such a tragedy to me to see the epidemic of loneliness that is sweeping North America and and know that we have simple solutions at our fingertips, we have public space that is not being activated. We have public spaces that because it is welcoming to cars uh, is completely um, inaccessible for for people uh, to, to experience their communities. And so I really want to, I want to encourage people to adopt the language of, of intentionality when it comes to their street design, to move beyond the idea of just saying, well, we want complete streets and to say, what is the intention of our public space? What is our goal with that public space? Who is it serving? How is it failing the people that we want it to serve? And then how can we change it? Because those are the key things that we're not asking when it comes to our streets and our public spaces in North America. And I think that um, we are really paying the price for it at every level. Yeah. We're, we're kind of also challenged in North America because of, of this dynamic. <laughs> yeah, this is. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna zoom in on this so people can get the real impact on this. This is ridiculous. Yeah, and you know, I think a lot of this. The the reason I included this photo, um, and this is you know, this is my daughter, and and you know, she's six years old um, in this photo, and and she's you know, she's standing in front of a you know a f- fairly large pickup truck. The reason I included this is that. I think that we're also, when, when we're unintentional about the design of our public spaces, I think we also start to become unintentional about the impacts that our private choices have on how people use those public spaces. I don't think that there is a lot of people who know that front over collisions are one of the fastest rising causes of death in the United States and Canada. Because we call them this innocuous thing. We call it a front over collision. And and horrifyingly, the most frequent front over collision is when someone gets into a truck like this and someone has a child like mine playing in their driveway and it's, it's a parent killing their own child. Yeah. Yeah. Because of the choice of vehicle. Yeah. More often than not, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. And, and we are, we are sleepwalking through decisions like that without ever taking a step back to think about the consequences. Yeah. And I think that a lot of that stems from the fact that we are just so welcomed on our streets, in our cars, that it, it becomes unquestioned that of course I'll have a car. Of course I'll drive, you know, a big truck. And I think that when we start to introduce intention in our decision-making at every level of our transportation and urban planning systems, I think that we really do 
have a better chance of, of stemming the tide of some of these, these really negative outcomes that we are seeing across North America. And so, you know, that, that, that image that you, that you showed, you know, it, it just, it always reminds me of, of how we're not, we're not really always thinking through the, the, the overall outcomes of our decisions. And I, I think nowhere is that more visible than on our streets. We're not thinking about the fact that, you know, when, when we, when we keep a, a residential street as, as a through street um, that people can use as a, as a bypass to an arterial road that's immediately adjacent to it, we don't think about the fact that what that does is limit the amount of, of interaction that those neighbors can have on that street. We don't think about the fact that it increases the anxiety of the parents that are walking their students to school, their kids to school on that street because of the, the, the speed and, and volume of traffic. And even if the, the volume isn't that high, um, we don't think about the fact that even just the threat of high-speed motor vehicle traffic kind of going down those streets leads to just a heightened level of anxiety when you're walking along those streets. You know, I, I, when I walk with my daughters and, and, you know, I'm walking with two of them, I've got a, a, a four-year-old and a seven-year-old and I'm walking with two of them. When I am walking in, in the downtown of my community, I am on constant high alert, constantly on high alert, because if either of them gets too far ahead of me, too close to an intersection, if either of them drifts too far over onto the, you know, on the sidewalk over getting closer to, to the, to the vehicles and the, the live lanes, that is, that is just like a, an anxiety inducing moment for any right. parent. And I don't think that we've had a conversation about the fact that it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. We can create public spaces where children and families are welcomed. We know how to do that. We're pretty good at it when we put our mind to it. But right. what we haven't done is think about what it would look like if we welcomed children and families and people with disabilities and seniors into our public spaces and how that might mean that we just have to accommodate cars. Yeah. It's okay for some public spaces to just be good enough for people driving. And I think that that is the, the, the point of the intentional streets idea that I've been coming forward with is that, you know, we don't have to make every single street great for cars. Right. Because when we do, when we make every single street great for cars, we make them at best just okay for people walking, cycling for children. Um, and so I think that we can do better in our yeah. public space. And that's what intentional streets is about. Yeah. <laughs> my, so, my hometown uh, example. And here's the hometown example. And, 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 you know, one of the things that, uh, that, that we hear, we get pushback on the size of the, the, the motor vehicles, the SUVs and the pickup trucks is that, uh, that, you know, no, we're, we're, we are intentional. We're buying this because this is an arms race. We want our family to be safe. And so we're, you know, it's this ever increasing size of these motor vehicles with the the belief that you know at least it's safer for me the occupant and my family the occupants and so i'm glad that you had mentioned that you know the that unintended consequence of the fact that you know you're you're inflicting harm to those around you and sometimes it's somebody within your own family so i, I just wanted to put a, a, a final note on that and then come to this image <laughs> because you're, you're so you're talking about intentional streets you're talking about public spaces so walk us through uh the reason why you you wanted to share this uh, this particular image yeah so this this is uh you know i was i was out for a ride and there's a you know kind of a standard painted bike lane on a on a street here in my hometown and there are signs posted that there is no parking in the bike lane Monday to Friday. This was a Saturday. Uh, and so I was out. Uh, it might've been a Sunday actually, cause uh, I, I think it's some church parking. And so, you know, I was, I was out and I was riding and this was the result is that, you know, me riding in a, in what is normally a relatively wide and relatively comfortable bike lane with my, with my six year old daughter, you know, we had to, we had to merge into a live lane of traffic because the intention of that street was even when we were accommodated was still to make cars feel even more welcomed. So even the, even the, the blank, even the, the minimal level of accommodation 
that is provided for for people uh, at a human scale on some of our corridors, you know, it is still just overwhelmed by our our uh, our preceding decision to welcome cars. And I think that that is like the piece that I really want to get to. Uh, you know, I really want to drive home when it comes to to the intentionality of our public space is that um, you know this is this is kind of a microcosm of of everything that I'm talking about when it comes to uh, to intentional streets. Um, when we are welcoming to cars, and when that is kind of one of our our, our first and foremost decision making criteria, uh, is to welcome cars. You know, we're we're never really going to get past accommodation for people walking and cycling. And you know, I mean, of course, like I'll 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 say too that just around the corner from this, literally under a block away, was a municipal parking lot that was that was essentially empty. And so, when it comes to the kinds of of decisions that we are making about who and why we are welcoming. I think that it is really important for us to, to be deliberate about saying, well, so who are you excluding in these, in these design decisions? Um, because when, you know, when the town put up the signs that said, uh, you know, no parking in these bike lanes, but only Monday to Friday, that was a deliberate choice. And there are deliberate choices at the heart of kind of every aspect of our, of our roadway design system that I think we we can and should be questioning. This is a really good example of just the mindset that goes into that kind of sleepwalking through uh, the way that we design and operate our public spaces. Yeah. So how do we navigate through this? <laughs> I think the way that I want to encourage people to navigate through it and to, to use the intentional streets philosophy is to start asking questions about streets as public spaces in their communities. To start asking, what does it mean when we create a street that is welcoming to people who walk or bike? I want us to imply the same degree of intentionality to creating people-focused streets that we do when we are creating highways. We created, just in the last you know, few decades, we created the, the diverging diamond interchange. Are you familiar with this? Thing? Oh yeah, definitely. So, yeah. so from, a, from a pedestrian and cyclist perspective, a diverging diamond in, interchange is, is, is a nightmare. Uh, it's it's horrifying to try and cross. even when they try to make it a complete street, it's still a, a nightmare. Absolutely. Yeah. From from a from a th vehicle throughput and road safety perspective, however, the diverging diamond interchange is amazing. Uh, yeah. It it moves more vehicles through more safely than than other intersection designs at at high speed roadways. Yeah. So when we design highways, we design them with barrier walls. We design them with prohibitions on people walking and cycling on them. We design them with wide, smooth lanes. We design them with minimal uh, interactions and intersections. We design them in such a way that they are extremely welcoming for people driving. What I want to challenge people to do is say, take that same sense of ingenuity. Take that same sense of saying, this is who we are designing to welcome. And then the fact that they're applying every single design decision along the road, uh, or sorry, along the street, I guess, um, yeah. to align with that with that primary function of that corridor and say, let's apply that to children. Let's apply that to seniors. Let's apply that to communities of color. Let's apply that to people walking. Let's apply that intentionality about how we are using our public space, that same degree of focus and ingenuity that we have displayed in creating a highway system that has become more and more safe over the years to creating a street system in our communities that serves the needs of the people who live there. Right. And that's what I really want people to, to take away from this is that we have the skills to do this. Mm -hmm. We just haven't been asking our designers the right questions. And I think that when we start to, when we start to see, you know, the, I, I think a lot about, about the, the infrastructure deficit ideas that, you know, that strong towns and, and, uh, and Chuck put out there and the idea that, you know, we are going to see a generation of infrastructure. The bill's going to come due on that pretty soon. Um, you know, we are already seeing it happening. 
And, and the, you know, I think that the, the overarching kind of ideal when it comes to, uh, to a lot of planning is, is to do more. Um, yeah. It's the idea of more is more. Um, and I, you know, one of the, one of the books that I read this year that, that was absolutely, um, you know, kind of game changing in terms of how I think about the world is, uh, is by Lydie Klotz and it's called the untapped power or subtract the untapped power of doing less. Mm-hmm. And, and it is a really interesting read because what it encourages us to do is think about how subtraction can add to our lives and subtraction can add to our communities. And the more that I thought about this, the more that I thought, the more spaces we subtract cars from in our communities, the more places we add people to. And that Mm -hmm. has really been part of what's been informing my discussion about intentional streets, because I think that we need to get to a place where we do identify some corridors that, you know, cars are going to be welcomed. We need to have some places still, you know, given the North American paradigm and the way that we are developed and, and where we're going in the next, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, we're going to need to have some streets where when we ask the question, like, who is the user that we want to welcome? The answer is going to be cars. And that's fine. Right. But where I draw issue is when the answer is always Everywhere. this street needs to welcome cars. <laughs> exactly. And that's yeah. the question that I want people to get at is that we will never do more with less if cars are still allowed every single place in our communities. We will never get to a place where walking and cycling are prioritized, where walking and cycling are safe, convenient, or comfortable, where children are able to get to school actively and safely, where seniors are able to move independently. Uh, We will never get to those places as long as we insist on having cars be welcomed on every street. And so I want us to get intentional about what our neighborhood streets look like. I want us to get intentional about what our collector roads look like. I want us to get intentional about what our arterial roads look like. In some instances, we are just going to accommodate people walking and cycling. Right. Those are fine things to do on those big strokes. Like if that's what we have to do to create spaces that people can move safely by walking or biking along those corridors is just to accommodate while still welcoming cars. Right. Then, then that's, that's a decision that a community can come to. But right now, we're not even having the discussion about whether that's a decision we want to make. Right. And we need to have that discussion. Yeah. I think one of the things I like to do is, you know, is is remind folks that, uh, hey, streets are for people first. And, and then you can kind of, you know, this this photo kind of comes to life in the sense that, OK, you know, this is clearly a, a residential street. Um, it's it's got one up on my streets. My streets don't even have uh, sidewalks on it. Um, it's truly, you know, completely shared space, uh, sort of a 1940s circa uh, neighborhood. But we, we end up seeing very similar scenes to this of just families, you know, taking over the streetscape and the space. And uh, ever since, you know, the pandemic, you know, we're we're basically going into, you know, three years now of uh, enjoying the fact that, you know, the people have taken over the streets. We've always had people walking and cycling and, and rolling and strolling through through the neighborhood, but it, you know, it went up 10x and it stayed up. And what was interesting is how driver behavior adjusted and we we can do better you know obviously as communities to uh to to take that next step to you know have some filtered permeability and have some you know do some design things to help uh alleviate the you know the possibility so that parents like yourself aren't worried that there's going to be a speeding motorist who's doing a rat run through the neighborhood uh is going to you know you know come in contact with our loved ones talk a little bit about this photo and why you wanted to 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 use this as a, a platform for discussion so this is uh, this was this was an example from again from from my uh, hometown here in Collingwood where we had a we had a pilot project um, where they did a a one month um, project where they they essentially kind of put up signs that said uh, you know this streets closed local traffic only and and they called it a bicycle priority street and you know what it ended up doing was was creating. A, quite a bit of, of conversation within the community. But, you know, the, the most important thing in my mind that it did was it created the idea 
that this street was primarily for for people who were walking and cycling and and for the people who live there for the enjoyment of the people who live there right and you know the the thing that that really hit home for me on this street was was just the the absolute sense of of joy uh, that my daughter had when we were riding on it because she felt like um, she was able to ride safely. This has has traditionally been kind of one of the more stressful parts of our ride to school, given the the volume. There's there's three schools at the end of the street, and um, so you know the traffic in the morning at drop off can be relatively high, and that traffic really dissipated. Um, and I think that what what a street like this does when when this kind of measure goes in is it shows what is possible with a relatively small investment and a relatively small change in mindset about what a street is for. You know, no sooner did the the pilot project come out and the barrels got got taken down and and everything kind of went back to normal. Then, you know, a week later, um, my daughter and I were, were riding to school and we were, we were honked at and yelled at by a parent who was driving their high school student to school to get the F off the road. Uh, and, and, you know, my, my six-year-old daughter pulled over onto the side of the road and, and started crying and started walking her bike. And, you know, I, I was, I was mad in the moment with that individual who made that decision to yell at a parent and a six-year-old, um, from their car. But in hindsight, I was more upset with the fact that we have designed our streets in such a way that it makes people feel that that space is theirs when they right. are in a car right. because of how much we welcome cars on those streets. And I thought to myself, where else would it be acceptable for someone to tell a six-year-old to get the F out of public space, to stop occupying public space? Where else would it be acceptable for an adult to yell that at a six-year-old, but on a street from their car. And those are the results of design decisions that we have made. And we have not fully processed what that does to our sense of empathy, to our sense of understanding, to our sense of connection with people around us. And so, you know, I bring this photo up because I'm, I'm saddened that the the community decided not to continue with the project because of what I would say was essentially no, there, there was no, you know, I'll, I'll say it, there was absolutely no uh, quantitative rationale behind removing something like this. Sure. But I think that, you know, what we did see was we saw fewer vehicles driving slower on this street and very little impact on the neighboring streets when it comes to, to volumes and speeds. So it, the vehicles just literally the trips just disappeared. And I think that that's what we fail to grasp when it comes to some of these, these concepts around intentional streets. You know, when we, when we are doing road reconstruction or we're doing a, you know, a below grade sewer repair or something in our communities, the town still largely works. That right. street is completely out of commission for people right. driving, yeah, but yeah. the town still largely works. Like people still can get around. Right. right and, yeah. and we haven't connected the dots, I think between the fact that, like those kinds of things happen all the time. Right. But I think that it's important for us to for us to take a step back and say, we have enough space that welcomes cars. We have enough streets that welcome cars that allow them to move effectively and efficiently through our communities. We should have some that also welcome children or people on bikes or seniors or people with mobility issues. And I think that that's really, you know, where where I want to get to with this. Yeah. To close this out, let's let's talk a little bit about um, the the challenge of of really changing the, the the narrative and changing the dynamic and and getting to healthier, more intentional designs that truly welcome people uh, to be able to occupy you know this public space. And the the way that I want to frame this up is is sort of in the context of what you just mentioned in terms of like you know hey when there's a need for sewer repair etc 
you know, shit happens and, you know, we adjust as humans, you know, we, it's amazing what happens. And, and the same with the, you know, the trial program, uh, you know, of, of, of making the, the, that a bicycle priority street, you know, people adjust and, you know, the traffic speeds go down. And what we're seeing in, in some cities around the, the, the globe is that we're seeing leadership. We're seeing people like Mayor Hildalgo in, in Paris, uh, just saying, hey, we've got a problem. We need to change and we're going to do this. And she plows forward and does it. And what do people do? They complain, they bitch, <laughs> you know, they, they have a fit, but then they adjust. Talk a little bit about what it's going to take for us to get to intentional street design and be able to, you know, I, I guess, give the politicians the the uh, the leeway uh, to be able to exert some political will and weather the, that storm. So I think that the biggest thing we need to start doing with with this movement is to start having adult conversations about what is possible when it comes to our infrastructure, when it comes to how our mobility is prioritized and, and who is prioritized and how it impacts our communities. In a lot of communities, we are having conversations where people want to have their cake and eat it too. And with complete streets, I think that that is, that is where we get into the trap where we end up with, with streets that are just ever widening um, to add, you know, multi-use paths and bike lanes and bus lanes and everything else. And, and what I think we need to get serious about in our conversations is talking about the fact that if we continue to welcome cars, we will eventually run out of space. It is just, it is just simple math in terms of how our, our limited public space can be all allocated. So, you know, when it comes to, to trying to move the needle on this, I think that it, it starts from a place of values. It starts from asking communities and residents, um, you know, what is it that you want to see your public spaces accomplish? What is it that you want to see expressed as a value in your community through the design of our public spaces? And I, I continue using the term public spaces deliberately because I think that when we talk about streets or roads, I think that it is easy to default to that old style of of imagining that, that space um, as prioritizing the movement of cars. And so I want to encourage people to conceptualize their streets as public space. I want them to understand that a street that is being prioritized for the movement of vehicles is no less valuable of a public good as a public space than the, the park that sits down on the waterfront. They are both public spaces that are, you know, that are in the public domain uh, and that we should all have an open and honest conversation about how that public space is being used. And when we are using our public space for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to, you know, kind of welcome cars and allow them to move through our neighborhoods and our communities at speed, what do we lose? And I think that those are the conversations that are not happening when it comes to our streets and our communities. So, so that's kind of, you know, what I, what I want to encourage people to do because we've seen over and over again that when there are, you know, when there are new lanes built, um, new traffic just fills it. Um, we've also seen that when you start to deprioritize the movement of automobiles, people start to move in different ways. There's a reason why the Netherlands is consistently rated the best country in the world for drivers. And it's because they don't prioritize driving on every single a a square inch of asphalt that they have. Um, it is because they have, they have come to a consensus as a, as a nation about, you know, what is the, what is the best way forward in terms of mobility? And they have some streets that are, that are fast. They have some fast roads. They have some streets that are quiet, um, but they have been much more intentional about how those streets are designed than we have here in North America. And so I think that what we need to start doing is, is asking those questions and, and really building relationships with the communities where these streets are, are, are going through, because I think that's going to be a key for us moving forward as well. Um, because what an intentional street looks like in Collingwood 
is going to look very different than what an intentional street is going to look like in Austin, is going to look very different than what an intentional street is going to look like in the south side of Chicago. You know, there are going Poten- to be... Potentially. Yeah, potentially. absolutely. It depends on the context. You know, this, this is one of my favorite shots. Uh, we use this photo for our first episode. And, you know, this is, you know... This is what I would say is an intentionally designed street uh, in Utrecht in the Netherlands. And it's a, a place that truly welcomes people. It's a street for people. It's public space that is welcoming. Uh, and, and oh, by the way, if you happen to be a driver and you're driving, you know, that car, uh, that blue car, uh, you, you are welcome. You're, you are able. You're not welcomed. <laughs> you're not invited, uh, but you have that ability to be able to be there. But the environment clearly states and is clearly designed that you are the guest, and which is the the, the typical Fietstraat, uh, a symbol that is used in the Netherlands is auto to gast. The auto is mm-hmm. a guest, meaning that they need to give way, give priority to people who are more vulnerable in that street space. And uh, I can think of no better way for us to close this off than to, you know, revisit this wonderful photo. <laughs> yeah, it's a good, it's a good, uh, yeah. I mean, it brings it really back, you know, full circle. The The idea yeah. of Feetstraat really was the thing that got me, I think, started to think about this in terms of in terms of what those look like and how we can we can start bringing that concept more realistically to north america and um you know i think that this becomes an extension and expansion of that yeah good stuff justin thank you so very much this is such a joy having you back on the active towns podcast hey thanks for having me john i really appreciate it Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Justin Jones. And if you did, remember, give it a thumbs up, (laughs) leave a comment down below, and uh, be sure to share it with a friend. Uh, The best way for us to grow this movement is for you to pass it along to somebody you know that might enjoy this. Uh, And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Uh, Just hit the subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell right next to it so you can customize your notification preferences. Oh, and one more thing, huge shout out to my Active Towns ambassadors for supporting my efforts out on Patreon, buy me a coffee, uh, the YouTube super thanks, uh, buying things from the Active Towns store, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit Every little bit helps and is much appreciated. Thank you all so very much.